Ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Environment Forum. My name is Chris Daniels, and I'm going to be the Master of Ceremonies for today's activities. I'd like to welcome the Premier, Mr Jay Weatherall, and Shadow Minister for the Environment, Michelle Lensick, who are here to answer your questions about the Environment and the Environment Act um, portfolio. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge that this is the land we meet on is the traditional lands of the Ghana people and that we respect their spiritual relationship with their country. We also acknowledge the Ghana people as the custodians of the Adelaide region and that their cultural and heritage beliefs are still as important to the living Ghana people today. I would also like to acknowledge the Honourable Ian Hunter, Minister for Environment, the Honourable Mark Parnell, MLC, Parliamentary Leader of the Greens, and Susan Close, MP, Labor member for Port Adelaide. This forum has been brought to you by the Conservation Council of SA, the Nature Conservation Society of South Australia, and the Wilderness Society. The quality of the South Australian environment is both integral and vital to the success of our community. There are a great many obvious reasons for supporting and protecting our environment. We should support it for its own sake. We have a responsibility to protect the life around us. The environment protects us. It protects us from climate change, wind, storms, even fire, when it is structured and managed appropriately. The environment supports industry, especially agriculture, fisheries, and tourism. The environment provides us with the highest quality air, soil, and water that we need to survive. And nature provides the quality of life that puts us into the top few most livable cities in the world. This quality of life both stabilises and improves the quality of our communities, but also attracts talented migrants to South Australia with all the benefits that that entails to our economy. Yet the environment is under enormous threat. We have seen garfish, cuttlefish, penguins and other species approach extinction. Water remains an unresolved issue, as is appropriate fire management and climate change is real and gathering place. Yet the environment seems to have fallen off the agenda. And most worrying, the efforts to, man to manage the environment are becoming disconnected and isolated, increasingly left to local government and community um, all through, uh, to undertake their activities managed through the NRM boards. So in fact, we can think of the environmental issues as involving, firstly, a failure to educate and connect our communities in science generally and in the environmental sciences in particular. We've seen the rise of narrow vested interest groups making extreme demands for their rights to exploit the environment and the reduction in coordinated efforts through less state and federal government involvement in environmental issues. If the environment degrades much further and climate change continues to impact us as hard or, as, or harder than the last month's heat waves, then the loss of tourism, agriculture, fisheries, quality of life could all be devastating. So it is fantastic here to have the Premier and Shadow Minister to express their views on the environment. Before I actually invite them to say their opening words, uh, there will be a short presentation from uh, Casey O'Brien, who's the President of the Biological Society of South Australia. After that, we will open to questions. Now, we have two formats for this. We have been soliciting questions through um, the interweb, which have been arriving uh, thick and fast, um, and you also have the opportunity to present your questions. We will have, uh, probably take it in turns uh, from the, uh, the internet and your questions. I ask you, I beg you, I demand that you keep your questions to about 25 words. This isn't the opportunity to um, give speeches or to soapbox, but to ask direct and clear questions. So to kick off the proceedings, can I invite Casey O'Brien, President of the Biological Society of South Australia, to the podium. Uh, she has just completed a first class honours in environmental science from Flinders Uni and is currently studying for a PhD in ecology and evolutionary biology at Adelaide. Thank you. Thank you. I am speaking to you today as someone who is incredibly concerned about the state of our environment and the world my generation is going to inherit. In my short lifetime, I have witnessed the environment degrade around me. Soils have become more saline. Weeds have taken over from native vegetation. Average temperatures have increased. Rainfall patterns have changed. And the number of threatened species has continued to increase. In the creeks around my home, where I once spent many hours playing as a child, catching frogs, tadpoles, and invertebrates, you are now lucky if you can hear the sound of a frog calling. 
The fairy penguins are so eagerly awaited to come ashore on Granite Island have all but gone. And the breeding aggregation of giant Australian cuttlefish, which I have dreamt about seeing, are disappearing. And my generation and those to come are now facing the very real possibility that we may never get to see these and many other species. It's easy to forget, but humans are part of the environment. And without a healthy environment, we cannot survive. We rely on the environment to provide goods and services that are essential for life. Resources that sustain us, such as foods, medicines, timber and fuels, are all provided by nature. The oxygen we breathe, the water we drink, and the soils we rely on to grow food are all dependent on a healthy, natural environment. We need to protect it, not just for ourselves, but also for the future generations. Our children and grandchildren deserve to grow up with the wonders of the world in their backyard, as we have, instead of learning about it from behind glass cases in museums or as pictures in books. We might not be able to restore the environment to what it once was, but we can save what we have now if we make better decisions in the future. We need to value our environment and stop over-exploiting our natural resources. Stop putting short-term economic gains before the environment. Stop making decisions that disregard science and stop cutting funding to the environmental budget. We know the health of our environment is declining and we know we need a healthy environment in order to survive and to maintain a stable economy. And so I call upon the government to take action to protect our environment before it's too late because we can save it if we act now. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Casey. And I would like to invite the Premier here to make some opening remarks. Well, thank you, Chris. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. And thank you, Casey. Thank you for reminding us that uh, our health, our well-being, our prosperity uh, is intimately linked to the health of our natural environment. Can I also acknowledge that we gather today on the traditional lands of the Ghana people, are people who supervised, superintended this natural environment and lived in harmony with it for tens of thousands of years. I'd like to also acknowledge uh, my ministerial colleague, the Minister of the Environment, the Honourable Ian Hunter. I'd also like to acknowledge the Honourable Mark Parnell, Greens MLC, and also the Honourable Michelle Lensing, Shadow Minister of the Environment, and also the member for Port Adelaide, who's here today, and uh, Susan Close. Um, the first thing I'd like to uh, observe is that the Leader of the Opposition is not here, and he should be here. This is a critical issue for South Australia, and it's not something that should be ducked by uh, the heads of both major political parties. Uh, and this is not the first debate he's ducked. He's ducked the education debate, he's ducked the SACOS debate, and also the press club debate. Now, it's to uh, Michelle's credit that she's here and I acknowledge uh, that she's the spokesperson for the Liberal Party, but that does not excuse the Liberal Party being represented at the highest level. Now, I know there is a temptation uh, with a government of 12 years' time to critique uh, what we haven't done, what we haven't been able to achieve over 12 years, and that's fair enough. You're entitled to do that. But elections are about a choice, about a choice between two competing sets of values and two competing sets of policies. And that's what I want to talk a little bit about today. But I want to start first with what we've achieved over the last 12 years together. We've legislated for the creation of 19 marine parks. An extraordinary achievement. <laughs> I must say we've done it, we've done it over, extraordinary, over extraordinary opposition. I worked very closely with a number of the uh, uh, representatives here, there's some fine public servants that work together with the community to actually make this happen and it was hard work and we were fought every step of the way. But we built a consensus around the science and we delivered on those marine parks. 
We also protected 1.8 million hectares of wilderness land, compared with just 70,000 hectares in 2002. Now it's worth remembering, it's worth remembering that that 70,000 occurred under the Bannon government. There was not one blade of grass added during the whole of the life of the, the Liberal government that followed it, and the remaining 1.8 million hectares was added by our government. We then uh, we increased the renewable energy generation from just 0.8% when we came into government to now over 30%. We banned single-use plastic bags. We've added 62 more national parks. We've added on a further 60 parks. We've achieved leading rates of recycling and decreased waste to landfill by almost 20%. We've passed climate change legislation and set in place emissions targets. And as a result, we have greenhouse gas emissions in South Australia that are lower today than 1990 levels. That's an extraordinary achievement. We've also achieved a sustainable future for our water resources. We've supported groundbreaking projects, increasing our stormwater harvesting capacity from 1 billion litres to 20 billion litres. We've realised a future for South Australia which is not dependent for its water security on the River Murray as a sole source of our water and we have fought and won the fight to get 3200 billion litres, gigalitres of water in environmental flows down that river. And I want to dwell a bit on that um, struggle because it was a struggle. We had to fight the upstream states we had uh, very powerful forces that were aligned against us. The irrigator communities in the upstream states tried to drag our irrigators along with them and form a, a global irrigator community against our attempts to actually get the water we needed down that river to make it a healthy river. Um, and to their credit, our irrigators stood with us, irrigators and conservationists, city and country, and we stood up against the upstream states and had an extraordinary victory. And if anybody wants to see whether the, the measure of the difference our campaign made, our fight for the River Murray campaign made, just look at the Murray-Darling Basin Plan. It sits there, 2,750 gigalitres of water, and then the extra 450 is strapped on, strapped on literally to the document with a locked box of about $1.77 billion to actually make sure that water comes down the river. And we, we didn't, and we did this in a way which actually meant that we protected our irrigators who'd done the right things by capping their, their take from the river. So there's a further, a further $290 million uh, of resources that's available to allow them to make the adjustments because the easy gains weren't available to them because they put all their pipes, uh, put all their irrigation under pipes and, and were drip irrigating. So this is an extraordinary victory for South Australia and what we were told at the time by our Liberal opponents is that we famously, Mitch Williams, we should settle for a Mazda and stop pressing for a Rolls Royce. We didn't accept that advice, we didn't accept the 2750 gigalitres because it wasn't enough. The science told us that it would not have delivered us a healthy river. That's why we stood up and fought, that's why we won. And that's how you get things in South Australia. You don't get anything by just sitting on your hands and politely asking. You get it if you're prepared to campaign, you're prepared to fight for your state. Now, there are lots of threats on the horizon at the moment. We've seen uh, really uh, just an extraordinary set of things occurring uh, in recent times at a national level. And frighteningly here, I think we're seeing echoes of it in the South Australian Liberals. We've seen uh, Tony Abbott's Liberals declare war on the renewable energy industry. We're now reviewing the, the RET scheme. Uh, it's not being reviewed for the purposes of making it uh, more comprehensive and better. It's being reviewed for the purposes of abolition. We've also seen uh, David Ridgway, the South Australian Liberals environment spokesperson, call for a moratorium on wind farms. Uh, we've also seen the Liberals say no to marine parks and sanctuary zones. Now, um, sanctuary zone, marine parks without sanctuary zones are not marine parks. And and what I can announce today uh, is to build on the achievement that uh, we've made together in establishing these 19 marine parks is to provide an additional $1 million per 
per year for monitoring, compliance and assessment programs to ensure effective management of the newly implemented parks. It's absolutely crucial that there is buy-in by the community to these parks. These parks will only operate uh, to the extent to which they're supervised, monitored uh, and supported by the community. So it's critical we get that buy-in, that's what this money is for. Um, what we also know is that uh, there have been many successes, as I said, in the recycling area. Zero Waste has been an extraordinary <coughs> catalyst organisation working since 2004 to help South Australians become the nation's best recyclers. And what I can say is that we're now morphing Zero Waste into a body which will focus its attention on green jobs. So the Adaptive Futures it will be the next phase of Zero Waste. It will lead the charge in embracing not only the next phase of waste management, but also innovation in the creation of green jobs. This is a massive opportunity for us. And so this is the next phase of operation for uh, this important initiative. Uh, we know that uh, across the nation, we're seeing um, extraordinary pressures on our budgets. And I know that there are some people that are concerned about the economies that have been made to the various budgets uh, that we've had to bring down in South Australia. And they've had a burden on our environment portfolio. There's no doubt about that. Uh, if you're growing your health budget and you've got shrinking revenues and you want to quarantine things like frontline services and health and education and police, the other sectors of the government are going to accept a greater proportion of that burden. And that has happened here. There's no doubt about that. But I ask you to make and reflect upon the choice. Our opponents say that debt and deficit is an issue that they want to grapple with in a more thoroughgoing way. They have promises out there, such as their $352 million in tax giveaways to the big end of town, which will have to be funded. Is it seriously being suggested that they are going to quarantine agencies like the Environment Portfolio from the cuts they will necessarily have to make to fund those promises? Now, I'm sure Michelle's not going to be able to give that commitment on behalf of her government. So when you, can, when you weigh up, you may be disappointed about some of the things that we haven't been able to do in the environment portfolio, but when you're weighing up the choice at the election, think about the cuts which necessarily are going to be, have to be on their way uh, if the Liberals were to attain government here. Uh, I'll conclude with just this uh, basic remark. We've, we've put out a, a lot of policies today. There's a further few policies that we're announcing, uh, including some additional supports to create and upgrade our parks. Uh, some additional support, to, as I said, in relation to marine parks. All of our commitments over the next four years amount to a further $28.9 million of additional resources into uh, the environment portfolio. And I'd ask you to reflect upon that and the commitments that our opponents are making. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'd now invite Michelle Lindsay, the Shadow Minister, to come forward. Can I also acknowledge all of my parliamentary colleagues, I won't name them all, um, but particularly the Premier. Um, I'm here because my leader trusts me. I speak for the environment on behalf of the Liberal Party and it's been my choice for when any leader has uh, put themselves up for uh, the Liberal Party leadership, I've always said I would like to represent the environment. It's an area that I've been passionate about for many, many years and uh, one which I have a personal commitment to. The Liberal Party believes that protection for the environment and biodiversity is most effective when it addresses the fact that damage is often caused through multiple assaults, the death by a thousand cuts, for instance clearance, invasive species, resource degradation and climate change. It is well documented that we have lost many endemic species on a large scale and we need to learn from past mistakes. And the old mantra before anyone knew better was, if it moves, shoot it, if it doesn't cut it down. But we have learned a great deal about the impact we have on our environment and about how it functions. Complexity is self-sustaining, whereas monoculture isn't resilient. Floral and faunal species serve their unique purposes in the ecosystem, for instance, to provide each other with nutrients and germination. In the urban context, trees and the tree canopy play an important role in mitigating climate extremes of temperature and stormwater events. And that's why I've been particularly concerned about the current government significant tree laws, which are now 
very vulnerable to being cut down. We have an oversized desalination plant and have therefore missed opportunities for aquifer storage and recharge, which would reduce nutrient and sediment load into the Gulf. Reform of the Murray has stalled. It's not fixed, as the Premier claims. Far from being saved, the system will suffer even more when the next drought occurs. This government is dragging its feet on engineering works to wet landscapes during low flows, and Lake Albert's salinity is still very high, and it's halved its commitment to the Murray-Darling Basin Authority joint programs. Adelaide's reliance on the Murray has not been reduced by one drop. You accepted a Mazda Premier. The Liberal Party will take a bioregional approach to enhance connectivity. We're going to look at the possibility of a Biodiversity and Conservation Act to harmonise the protections between native parks, natural resource management and native vegetation. For instance, if there's damage done to native vegetation in a conservation park in metropolitan Adelaide, the uh, maximum penalty is $10,000. It hasn't been reviewed since this government's been in place. But on private property outside the metropolitan area under the Native Vegetation Act, that would attract a, a penalty in the order of hundreds of thousands of dollars, which is much more appropriate. Conservation actions uh, should be based on regional audits and threat assessments which in practice means greater connectivity between biodiversity on uh, public land through parks and reserves and private land, natural resource management, which is where a lot of e uh, intact ecosystems also exist, with corridors to assist movement of species and therefore climate change resilience. The Liberal Party will facilitate our community's involvement in enhancing our environments across this state. We've already made an announcement to increase the park range and numbers from the appalling 88 uh, by 12 and will also be um, allowing funding uh, for more experienced recruits in that mix. Within our parks and reserves we'd like to um, implement the Grey No Band program which operates in Western Australia and also enhance the volunteer effort across our Friends of Parks. Just a few weeks ago I visited the um, Hallett Cove Conservation Park uh, with the Friends who've done an absolutely outstanding job in habitat restoration, direct seeding, weed management and so forth. And much of that has been without the imprimatur of the government. We'd like to extend the role of the Sustainable Landscapes Project into planting local provenance into local parks and home gardens. And in conjunction with our local government, uh, improve the greening of spaces and water sensitive urban design. We think the government should lead by example with green buildings which will reduce uh, water and energy use and reinstall the spirit of land care into the operations of natural resource management for greater cooperation. It's my vision that households will participate in, in replanting endemic species so that, for instance, we could see greater numbers of, supported, of support for endangered species such as coastal butterflies. I believe that people in our community want to do the right thing when they own how, and we've seen this many times through recycling, clean-up days, drought water ice, domestic solar panels, and I look forward to um, providing more opportunity for you to um, know more of our policies through the questions that I know are coming. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Michelle. Now we have about 40 minutes and this part is up to you. So if you are thinking of any questions, please jot them down on the piece of paper and pass them to the end of the rows where there are people who can collect them. Uh, as I said, keep them to 25 words, keep them clean, and um, pass them forward. So the, the first question we have actually has come, come through last night, it's come through the, the, uh, the inter, uh, the interweb, I keep calling it, the web, uh, and it's from Catherine and Jeb, who ask about marine parks. As we speak, there is a national gathering of people in Sydney concerned about the future of marine parks in Australia. After 10 years of debate and community consultation, this has emerged as a key point of difference between Labor and Liberal this election. For Labor, will you maintain your full commitment to sanctuary zones as they currently stand, no matter what the result of the election? And for the Liberals, what is the scientific basis for a threat-based approach over the current comprehensive, adequate and representative or CAR approach? Yes. Yes, is my answer. Um, That's a good 
thank you, Chris. Um, I'd like to correct something that the Labor Party so keeps saying, which is that the Liberal Party doesn't support marine parks. We started the process uh, well over uh, 12 years ago. Um, where I think uh, this current process has gone wrong has been the establishment of the parks and the um, lack of um, engagement with the local communities. I've been on a parliamentary committee and I've got to say, I don't believe country people lie very often and I've heard so much evidence and advice for them about that process. If you, there was reference, I think the Premier might have said that you need to get local people to um, buy into the process and nothing could be truer. Um, we've got a vast network of um, marine parks and the local people are going to play a very large role in policing them. The current budget um, prior to the Premier's announcement for compliance was about $160,000. Um, that's clearly not enough. Uh, if you look at areas like the Pelican Lagoon on the Kangaroo Island, the locals self-manage that. If they see anybody in there with a fishing line or a tinny, uh, they, um, they go there and ask them what they're doing. Um, so we think that the community engagement with that was really, really bad. Those communities are quite exhausted and the uh, secret meeting that was held in April 2012 are the zones that we're particularly concerned about because they never went back to the communities. And if I can start by referring to the um, science of how you establish it, this document is from, um, uh, I think this is the Janine Baker report, key steps in the development of a national representative system. Step one, gather baseline data including ecosystem mapping. Well, that was, uh, a lot of that was flawed. Step two, identification of threatening processes. Now that never actually took place. So that unfortunately is the legacy of where this was at. If we look at the land care example, working in conjunction with regional communities would have been the way to work, work it, but um, I, I, and I probably don't have too many friends in the room for what I've just said, but I really think you've got to get the community with you and when you do, you treat them the way this current government has treated them, this is the outcome. It's a bit of a sticky mess, um, but most of them will stick with but those ones from the secret meeting are the ones that we need to review. Thank you, Michelle. Sure. Premier? I, I really do have to take that up. I mean, I was at a lot of those meetings and, and, and there have been a, a series of ministers uh, in the portfolio because this was an extraordinarily long process. Every step of it uh, involved the most detailed discussions uh, in the regions uh, with um, on the ground. In fact, we set up local advisory groups um, I mean, it, it was a Rolls-Royce consultation process. It's probably the best consultation process I've seen in 12 years of being in public life. Now, you might criticise the outcome of it, but it is just not fair to the, to the public servants involved to just sweat blood over that process. And also the, uh, you know, the efforts that were made by all of us to, to get to grapple with these things. The truth is we made compromises, which largely because of the resistance of some of the, uh, the fishing and commercial interests, which um, we you know, probably would have preferred not to make, but we were trying to pay respect to those regional communities and trying to address their concerns and trying to build a consensus, because we were powerfully influenced by the fact that we were going to have to rely upon the, the users of the resource to be able to police these marine parks. So we put an above average premium on reaching agreement. That's why we kept going. That's why it went on for so long. It's because we tried to reach a consensus. And you know, the, the fact that we actually came back and tried another attempt at compromises, now being visited against us, all it was trying, what we were trying to do was to actually get the broadest possible consensus. And I think, I think we have, if you actually see the buyback process now, it's largely gone by consent. I think there's been a, a large amount of consensus. There are still some people that are upset, but I think it's been a great process. Thank you very much. Our second, our second question is from Matt Parnell on climate change and fossil fuels. Okay, we, might, we might keep the clapping down a little bit. I think we need to get to the questions. Uh, the cheering can wait till the end. Thanks, Chris. And my question is about uh, climate change. And I refer uh, Jane and Michelle to the report that was produced by the Climate Commission last year, just before they were sacked. 
where they said we need to leave 80% of the world's fossil fuels in the ground if we are to avoid dangerous climate change. And just one sentence from one of the authors of that report, Professor Leslie Hughes, she said, in order to achieve that goal of stabilising the climate at two degrees or less, we simply have to leave about 80% of the world's fossil fuel reserves in the ground. We cannot afford to burn them and still have a stable and safe climate. So my question is, do you accept that advice? If you don't accept it, what do you know about climate change that the scientists don't know? And if you do accept that advice, which 80% of South Australia's coal and gas should stay in the ground? Because as far as I've seen, the government has never rejected a fossil fuel project on the grounds of climate change. Thank you. Thank you. Well, the first thing to say is that we have extraordinarily ambitious targets in relation to renewable energy. And I don't think anybody could uh, fairly criticise this government for its lack of effort in that regard. We set a target of 20%, we busted it. We've set a target of 33% by 2020, and we're almost hit that. So every target we set, we exceed, and we're now, now going to set another stretch target uh, for ourselves. So, um, and we have obviously our, our uh, climate uh, advisors, climate change advisors, uh, providing us with a report that we intend to act upon. Uh, but uh, obviously there are real life considerations about what are transitional fuels, and we know that that gas does emit less carbon pollution. Now, uh, it is an important transitional fuel and uh, it is part of the solution, it's not the long-term solution. Uh, but we are committed, as we're committed to pursuing the solar thermal option, we're supporting a business case there and uh, we intend to pursue that. Uh, we have the only manufacturer of solar panels in the nation here in South Australia. And there's a reason that that's happened. It's because we've actually uh, taken a lead on this issue. And we've actually got some other exciting businesses that are setting up. Zen Energy is really on the verge of unlocking the secret of battery technology, which could completely revolutionise our approach to renewable energy. But in the, in the short term, we also uh, have to continue to... Uh, uh, to promote the, the development of the state. I suspect, though, that we've only touched a fraction of our fossil uh, fuel um, uh, capacity in South Australia. I, I don't know what it would be, but I'm sure it, uh, it is nothing like 20% uh, of uh, the uh, fossil fuels uh, that exist in uh, South Australia, given our abundant uh, minerality. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I think the good news in South Australia... This is a bit awkward. Uh, is that um, uh, for any future electricity capacity is highly unlikely to come from uh, fossil fuels. The settings are very much in favour of, particularly for wind energy. Uh, so the state through the Greenhouse Gas Emissions Act has got its state targets and I think there's um, support across the, the parties for those. Uh, and uh, the national electricity market is currently oversupplied. So I think as far as us pulling our weight, um, we're doing really well with um, the installed wind and, and solar energy. And also, can I just add too that the solar therm thermal proposal for um, uh, Port Augusta, um, we've been uh, very supportive of that and had an uh, inquiry through the Parliament and that's actually led to a feasibility study which is being looked at. I was reading some comments from uh, the chap from Arena who was sounding very buoyant about it, so uh, I guess you know we'll, we'll wait with anticipation to see what the outcome of that is. Thank you, Michelle. I think we'll, we'll move on now to Matt, who has a question about Simpson Desert. In the lead up to the state election in 2010, both Labor and Liberal, Liberal agreed to progress wilderness protection for the Simpson Desert. In 2012, the Wilderness Advisory Committee reported to government that the entire South Australia section of the Simpson Desert is worthy of wilderness protection. For about two years, very little action has occurred. Uh, what will your party do to deliver a genuine outcome on this important election commitment? That's from Matt. Michelle, will you start first? Yes, start? Uh, thank you, Matt, and uh, thank you for giving me a heads up that the Wilderness Committee had actually reported in our formal reply to uh, the three conservation groups who put the question to us about the Simpson Desert. We said four years ago that we were happy to refer it to the Wilderness Advisory Committee. I wasn't actually aware that they'd uh, done a report. So um, if the Liberal Party does happen to be elected uh, on the 15th of March, then obviously I'll, I'll look at that very favourably. Thank you. 
Thank you, Michelle. Premier. Uh, consistent with our commitment, we'll progress that report. Um, it is a valuable report. It is consistent with the commitment that we made. Uh, obviously, we need to manage uh, all of the interests uh, associated with the use of that sensitive area of South Australia. Thank you. Our fourth question comes from Emma, who's actually asked for a video to be played uh, before we actually ask her question, um, called the Endangered Ra Range of Video. So perhaps we might play that. <laughs> I'm here in remote South Australia on the trail of a species which has been disappearing from the face of the earth, the Rangurius parachii, otherwise known as the South Australian Park Ranger. Their numbers have plummeted due to the very poor resources provided for it. I've travelled thousands of miles to spot one of these rare creatures. However, today, I think my look may change. Ah, I think I see one of them. <laughs> and here it is. The park ranger performs an invaluable role in its ecosystem, keeping pests and weeds at bay, maintaining trails, talking to visitors, and fighting fires. Loss of this species would prove disastrous to unique places such as this. The ranger is a close cousin of the common city council gardener. But these useful animals are far more numerous. We know that with the right action, we can restore healthy, thriving populations of park rangers to look after national parks across the state. To achieve this, we need to invest considerably more resources which will benefit all of South Australia's wild places and the people who love them. Thank you for that. So now we come to Emma's question. Uh, do you agree that a healthy environment is critical to human health, mental health and hence happiness? If yes, how does your party justify supporting the massive cuts far more than just about every other part of government that are currently underway in the Department for Environment, including 30 to 40% cut in this next year alone. I know you have touched on this, Premier, but it is worth while we visit. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I've made the general point about uh, the rest of the government having to accommodate uh, shrinking revenues and increasing uh, expenditure. But it's worth saying, I think, in the, that context, that there have been some discrete uh, additional resources that have been applied in this area. There was a substantial increase in the firefighting resources that were made available uh, to uh, the Department of uh, Environment and Natural Heritage, um, and uh, natural resources, I should say, and uh, uh, very substantial additional resources. That's traditionally been seen as part of the role of the park ranger. Also, what we've seen with parks is a very substantial increase in the number of parks which are now under Aboriginal co-management and uh, native title holders now co-manage over 32 parks and reserves around the state. And those arrangements cover about 13.5 million hectares, representing about 64% of the area of our park system. So that's been, a, and that's been supported with resources. That's been a very substantial improvement over the life of this government. Uh, and uh, that, recognize, that, that adds obviously to the, uh, uh, to the uh, way in which we can present that experience to people that visit our parks as well. But look, there's no getting away from it. it uh, the, the burden of adjustment has fallen on some agencies uh, to a greater degree than others. Um, but I just ask you to reflect, where do you think Stephen Marshall was going to find his savings from? And um, I'm sure Michelle can't tell us that he's going to quarantine the environment department. Michelle. Uh, well, we've obviously made the announcement that I referred to about our park ranges, and when the government talks about the number of um, protected areas it's increased, it's absolutely meaningless unless you've got the, the ranges in the system to police them. Um, when we um, left office in 2002, we cleaned up in a, in a phenomenal uh, state bank debt, and we're back there all over again. Um, $14 billion, uh, the deficit is, a billion dollar interest bill every year, which is more than the entire police budget and four times the environment budget. 
and there's only one person in this room who's presided over the Cabinet in the last 12 years. So when you're thinking about that, I'd ask, I'd ask you to reflect upon uh, who, when they were in office, managed to uh, get the park ranger numbers up to 300 after a disastrous uh, economic problem that we've had cleaning up Labor's mess again, and also reflect on whether forgiving the debt of elite football teams through the Adelaide Oval deal was an appropriate priority, whether a $40 million footbridge was an appropriate priority, and whether building a $2 billion desalination plant against the advice of due diligence of federal agencies was an appropriate priority. The budget is an absolute mess. If elected, the Liberal Party will do its best to clean it up. We don't think we can get back into the black uh, within our first term. And we will do the uh, absolute necessary works for the vital services rather than the frippery of the current government. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Michelle. I think we'll, we'll move on to ones where we've got quite a number related to each other. So I'd like to start with Jeanette. Is Jeanette here? Jeanette has asked uh, one that several have asked about um, long, uh, long term visions. Oh, she is there? So would you like to ask your question? <laughs> oh, your long term vision doesn't extend to remembering your question. Um, right. Shall I read it out for you? It's really good. Describe the type of natural environment you would like to have in place when your grandchildren's grandchildren are born. What will you do in government to contribute to that reality? And there have been several questions here related to that and to some of the recent um, announcements to Michelle. Do you agree with your federal leader that there's too much land locked up in national parks? No. <laughs> I'd love to ask you, and there's a number around that, but, but the idea of a long-term vision for grandchildren's grandchildren. Premier first? Oh, I'm sorry. Well, um, to be able to do some of the things that we were able to do when we were little, like, as you say, going down to creeks and playing them and finding tadpoles and seeing some of the natural environment actually restored. Now, uh, it is amazing how resilient the natural environment can be. Uh, we've seen, uh, just in recent times, uh, some of the things that are occurring in the River Murray uh, with some flows being restored there. Of course, there's lots of damage and there are some things which perhaps have been irreparably changed, but restoring as much of our uh, natural environment as we can, protecting obviously species from uh, further degradation and extinction. But also uh, much of our vision set out in the document that, that we've produced and some of you I hope have, is about inviting the community and in particular our young people to be part of and experience our natural environment. Our Nature Play initiative is all about ensuring that young people grow up with a sense of wonder and love of our natural environment. Not only does that uh, good for themselves and their well-being and allows them to develop and learn, it also gives a, a, a group of citizens that will value and be prepared to uh, support and protect our natural environment, that become the custodians of our natural environment in the future. So my vision is for a community that is much more connected with its natural environment, uh, is able to enjoy and um, experience it uh, in a way which is so much more part of their daily lives. In that way, the growing support for it gives us the political permission to obtain the resources necessary to take the steps to protect, preserve, and in some cases, restore the damage that we've all done. Thank you. Michelle. Um, thanks, Chris, and, and thanks for the question. And if I can just address the, the issue of what the Prime Minister said the other day, I kind of it was a bit of a WTF moment for me. Um, so can I just put distance between that and in any case the uh, decisions about whether um, parks uh, are within the system is entirely the one for the state government and that will remain so. Um, vision for future generations, well I think, um, and I referred a fair bit of it in my speech to restoration of landscapes and people understanding uh, ecosystems and so forth. I think literacy uh, Environmental literacy within our community and education is really important and um, the Premier mentioned Nature Play and we, uh, Ian Hunter um, launched that recently which I think is a, a really fabulous initiative just for people to try and understand how the natural environment works. 
I think once you give people the tools, they naturally uh, want to be involved. So at a very basic level, whether it's all you know, school kids um, being involved in creek restoration um, or, or families going down to their local park and planting the endemic local species, I think for, for that to be really embedded within uh, the community at, at a very knowledgeable level, there are people who pick it up along the way, and I'll talk about the Helico Conservation Park um, volunteers. I mean, Trevor, who took me around in his four-wheel drive, is a, a former banker, and he was, you know, talking fluently about direct seeding. He's been collecting local native provenance. He's gone to adjacent parks and collected them. He's learned an enormous amount, and just through that process, uh, he's really assisted in, in the restoration of that landscape. So that sort of knowledge uh, really deeply embedded in our community so that we are restoring landscapes and, and bringing things back from, from the brink and into healthy numbers is, is what I'd like to see. It's, it's happening on a scale. I think the last couple of generations of people, I talked about the whole previous attitude people have. I mean, for goodness sake, the South Australian government 50 years ago or 100 years ago used to pay people to clear land. It's just, it's just a complete shift in consciousness. And I think once we reach that, then we'll be really winning the battle. Thank you very much. Now, we've got a, a, a couple, two or three actually, on sustainable populations. So I think I'd like to throw it to Peter at the back who might like to ask his question about, I think it's you? No? Well, I'll have to hold on that. Is there, well, is there a Peter here who asks him about sustainable? There. Oh, sorry, Peter. No wonder I was waving to you and you are just waving back. He <laughs> 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 was. He was. I thought I was a bit weird. Anyway, Thank you, Chris. I wasn't sure which thing you were talking about. And the question was, really not so much about population growth as about the elephant in the room here, which is uh, the prevailing neoclassical economic paradigm of endless growth, and that includes uh, uh, endless population growth. So both political parties uh, are clearly, at state and federal levels, strongly attached to, the, to this prevailing paradigm of, of endless growth. And my question to the parties is, when will they officially and openly abandon their adherence to this, uh, this economic paradigm and embrace the principle of steady state economy. Can we start with this Well, I don't, I don't think I've ever actually talked about growth as part of my paradigm, to be honest. I think that's sort of a little bit of, might be a bit sort of 80s or 90s concept. Um, um, well, um, obviously we're interested in growth and sustainable growth for the purposes of providing uh, employment for our citizens and it's a central issue in this campaign. I think the, the, the key question is, uh, is not so much whether we should have growth but what type of growth it should be. In much the same way, it, it really becomes the same question about population growth. I mean, the, the, the truth is that, that the barring some pretty extreme things, the number of people in the world is not something that's going to be influenced by us. What we can influence though is how they live, whether they live sustainably. So if they're within our borders, we, we should be focusing on uh, the sustainable uh, means by which we actually go about our daily lives. The way we look at population growth isn't and this, I think, is a slight point of difference, not a massive point of difference, but a slight point of difference between the parties here. I mean, we're, we're facing potentially about 13,000 people coming onto the jobs market with the closure of problems and the, the consequential effects. I think population growth should principally be seen as a means of uh, actually meeting your workforce needs rather than as, a, as an end in itself, because there's no direct correlation between population growth and economic growth. In fact, if you, if you go to Africa, you might say population growth is not consistent with economic growth. If you go to Sweden, you see very slow growth and very high economic growth. So the, the correlation is not direct, but it, it can play an important role in meeting the, obviously the needs of a, a growing uh, economy in terms of skills mix. But if you've got 13,000 people cascading onto your job market, your principal concern should be skills and looking to find something for those citizens. So that's our focus in terms of population growth. Thank you, Premier. Uh, we have a question from Anne on fracking in the South East. Is Anne here? Sorry, again. 
Currently, exploration drilling for unconventional gas is underway in South Australia's most precious Coonawarra area, causing a huge amount of community concerns. Both Victorian and New South Wales governments have placed a moratorium on fracking until more research is done on the shocking impact of water and the health of local communities. Why won't you support a similar moratorium in South Australia? Um, well, the first thing is that uh, hydraulic fracturing has been undertaken in South Australia for approximately 40 years. And uh, obviously in less sensitive areas, principally the Cooper Basin. And uh, obviously now there is some exploration in uh, areas of uh, the South East which are sensitive. I can tell you that the, one of the great strengths of the South Australian uh, mineral resources sector has been uh, an acceptance that beyond just the environmental and other regulatory permissions that are needed, there really does need to be uh, if you like a social license or so granted. These companies are well aware that uh, if they run into very widespread community opposition they won't be able to run successful projects. And so um, I'm absolutely confident that the, the companies involved who are very well aware of some of the mistakes that have been made in other jurisdictions uh, will not only ensure they have the most rigorous environmental standards but they won't take uh, any further steps beyond obviously they're in just an exploration phase at the moment until they've sought to build that community permission. Now I know that there are strong feelings about some of these things but I think we do need to be guided by the science uh, and also um, by uh, I think some of the realities of uh, the demands that, that, that are actually coming upon us in terms of uh, the supply of natural gas uh, in relation to our energy needs around the nation. So. Look, I, I do know that uh, this is going to be a controversial issue in the South East. There's no suggestion though, that there's any proved up uh, wells there that will lead to, to any application for a mining licence or an extraction at this point. Michelle? Um, I spend a lot of time in the South East and so I'm very well aware of the community sentiment. I'm also very well aware of how valuable the groundwater resource is to uh, the South East region. There's, um, vineyards, dairy farms, horticulture. The whole uh, community down there is completely dependent on that water resource. And so we're not interested in anything that's going to do damage to that water resource. Uh, the water resources um, across the state all vary in terms of their hydrology and very complex um, science down there. And uh, therefore we've uh, we've um, decided that we would have a parliamentary committee, one of the standing committees will be tasked with uh, going down, visiting the local communities, um, seeking their input and getting the best available science um, before we make a decision about how we would proceed. Thank you, Michelle. Now we've got a number of, of questions and, and comments around biodiversity, but I think it's um, well encapsulated by Nikki's question here, which says that the recent State of the Environment report showed 24 of 27 environmental indicators to be in poor or very poor condition, with particularly poor measures for biodiversity. How will your party act to ensure the long-term protection of high-value biodiversity conservation areas that are under underrepresented in the reserve system? And this also comes to Casey's point about some of our iconic species as well. Premier. Perhaps I'll begin by uh, making a further announcement today. Uh, we'll uh, establish an area which is already listed as being of national and international significance for migratory shorebirds. Uh, that is uh, an area that will be created for an Adelaide International Bird Sanctuary. Um, we'll provide a range of ecological benefits uh, to the area. Uh, this area uh, will be uh, set out um, uh, in the uh, former Dry Creek salt fields and uh, we're committing to it, it's, uh, creating an extensive conservation sanctuary in that particular area. It's something that's been a product of a number of representations over the extended period. Thank you. Michelle. Um, well, the, the issue of how to support our biodiversity, I think I, I spoke about um, in my introductory remarks, so I think um, 
um, working out what's where and, and what's under most threat and uh, what needs restoration, collecting local provenance, um, seeding programs and so forth, and trying to bring some of the species back, like it's happened with um, some of the wallaby species in the outback. Those are the sorts of programs, I think, that will increase the resilience of our biodiversity into the future. Thank you. Which gives me the right of the very last question before I invite you to have your, your closing comments. And that is, I heard a really disturbing term a couple of days ago. It was conservation exhaustion. And in fact, the, the person who was discussing this was referring to the fact that many of these, um, the laws, the regulations, the policies that have been developed over the last 10 to 15 years um, have been incredibly exhausting for the community as well as for the, the conservation agencies involved. And they include things like the significant tree legislation, marine parks, of course, um, a whole swag of natural resource management, fire, native veg, uh, and so on. When do we settle them into a, a way forward for the community? Or do we continually revisit all of these policies uh, because we have less and less people who are becoming more and more exhausted as part of the, the policy preparation? Well, I think each of those pieces of legislation has been, has sort of got a history as to why they evolved. And the National Parks and Wildlife is probably the oldest um, piece of legislation among those, uh, followed by native vegetation. So and native vegetation was, I think, in response to uh, the continual clearance and the recognition that if we didn't put some checks and balances in it, then there wouldn't be anything left. So um, I referred to this concept of a Biodiversity and Conservation Act, where I think we sort of look back at history and say, all right, well, we, we did our best at the time, uh, but we need to put the um, protection and enhancement of biodiversity and conservation at the centre of these acts and make sure that all of them are consistent. So that's a big job. I know that's a very uh, ambitious task, but it's something that um, I would certainly um, welcome the, the input of everybody in this room on. Thank you, Michelle. Great. Um, yeah, I must say, I've heard it mentioned in the context of rain parks, and it, it, it does irritate me slightly, I've got to say, because having been involved in that struggle, and a number of people in this room were involved in that struggle, um, it was a struggle. You know, we were fighting to protect uh, what is some of the most uh, extraordinary sort of natural environment that exists anywhere in this country. I mean, there's so many endemic species in plants, wildlife, fish here in South Australia, we were serving up what was the overwhelming majority of the scientific opinion about these matters. And we were uh, engaging in, as I say, you know, uh, an extensive process of community consultation. And uh, because it went on for so long and we were fought at every step, uh, then at the end what gets visited against us is that well, we're all exhausted. Well, <laughs> okay, but we were, we're trying to actually you know, protect the natural environment uh, and people are resisting it and we're paying you the respect of, of actually listening to your arguments, even when some of the arguments, frankly, were uh, less than robust. Um, and I, I think maybe there is a point at which that sometimes you have to just crash through and say, well, let's, let's put it in place and see what happens. And after you've done as much as you can, you have to exercise the function of leadership. And, I have to look, I'm confident that, I mean, just, I mean, when I saw the little bin, you know, here in my house where I put all my food scraps in it, that took, you know, a couple of weeks to get organised. But now I do it routinely, it's not a burden, you know, and now I just, we almost put nothing in the bin and everything in the recycling and this other thing. I mean, people can change, of course, you know, it may feel like a burden, but you quickly, adapt and so I, I wouldn't be too worried about the exhaustion thing I think high quality regulation as long as it's not meaningless red tape I think is uh, you know I think can make a contribution thank you very much so I think on that note I will now invite Michelle to have her closing remarks followed by the back. Uh, thank you, Chris. I didn't actually realise we were, well, you did tell me at the start we were going to get closing remarks, but I haven't really prepared for them. So um, I'd like to um, thank everybody for coming. It's actually really fantastic to um, see such a huge number of people um, coming out to um, listen to a debate about the environment on a Friday lunchtime. Um, the issue of funding in the Environment Department is something that I raised uh, in, in relation to the 2010-11 budget. And I felt a little bit alone because I didn't get much support from any, any sector. So 
Um, it's really unfortunate that it's got to this point really. Um, hugely disappointing for those of us who are very passionate about the environment. Um, the Premier has a cabinet which is very, very right wing, unashamedly uh, pro-mining and regardless of who gets elected on the 15th of March, you're more than likely to have Tom Coots and Tonus or John Rao as the leader of the Labor Party. So I think you need to bear that in mind. So that's the interesting side of it. The good news is, is that I have an announcement which I thought we were going to get a question about the EDO. Uh, but uh, Stephen Marshall uh, came into my office the other day and he said, I think we need to look after these guys because they've had their federal funding cut. So I'm pleased to announce that uh, we'll provide them with uh, $50,000. Uh, to enable them to keep their doors open after the 30th of June. Well, thank you for that. Uh, perhaps we'll just wait until we get through the election first before we start. Um, now, uh, first thing I want to say about the, uh, the, the choice, it's the reason why the leader should have been here. I mean, I, with all due respect to Michelle, I, I, I don't doubt her giving her obvious um, understanding of uh, the environment portfolio, and I, I think I debated you in 2010. And I think you promised the Environment and Biodiversity Act back then. Uh, <laughs> that's right, you are. <laughs> Maybe you could have sort of organised to reduce private members bill in the last four years. But, the, but, but, um, but can, I say, can I say about uh, that, that the reason why it is important to have the leader here rather than uh, the, uh, the show uh, spokesperson, is because you have to look at the complete picture, because it, it, it's not enough to simply uh, pick off some of the savings that we've made, and, and they have. They've, they've definitely placed burdens on particular agencies. You actually have to look at the, the whole of the, uh, the choices that are actually in front of the community to see the reality of what's being presented here. There are going to be deep cuts. That's what's going to happen under an incoming Liberal government. I mean, I, if, you, if you don't accept that, then you don't accept that uh, when they complain about debt and deficit that they're serious, or that uh, when they say they're not going to increase taxes that they're not telling you the truth, or they say they're not going to privatise, they're not telling you the truth. There's only one thing left if you don't suspend the law of mathematics, and that's to actually cut something. And if you think it's not going to be the agencies like the Environment Portfolio, you're kidding yourself. That's exactly... That's exactly... But, but hold on beyond what we've had to do to get the budget in the condition that you say is in such a you shocking state. You where the other cuts are. Well, you're the ones... You had to go. Okay, well, well, Michelle... Well, we've got well, to... Michelle, we've got to... We haven't done much, really. Final minute. I'm, I'm pretty relaxed about this. I don't think it's a difficult thing to understand. I mean, you criticise the state of our budget, that's fine. We, we put the triple A on the line so that we could maintain uh, some of the services and the things that we do. We, I made that decision. I wasn't going to chase revenues down as far as they needed to go to actually give a balanced budget. That's the choice that we made and we will balance it over time. But uh, you, you can't criticise those choices and say so you're going to actually do it quicker or cut more deeply and you've also got all these other promises out there, these tax giveaways. They're going to have to be paid for somehow. They have to be paid for through cuts. So, you know, it's fine to just come in here and say, well, here's a million dollars for some ranges. You couldn't answer the question about whether environment was going to be quarantined from the other savings initiatives that your government would make if it formed a government. So that really means you could be facing very much more cuts than the, the million dollars that are going to be thrown around to try and locate you. So, that's the real life choice, and that's why they have to show a spokesperson here, because that bigger picture question uh, was unable to be grappled with. So when you do go to the election, um, think about some of the things that we've done over the last 12 years together. Extraordinary achievements, much more to be done, fully accept that, but uh, it would be a massive step backwards for the environment uh, if we were to contemplate a little bit. Thank you very much. And on behalf of the Conservation Council, the Nature Conservation Society, the Wilderness Society, I'd particularly like to thank both of you for coming along and spending an hour with us, bringing the environment back up to the level of importance that it really deserves.
And I need to thank also all of the volunteers and staff who put on the, uh, the event today. They've done a terrific job. Thank you for all coming. Thank you for being well behaved. Give you a question, sure. And uh, that's the end of the proceedings. Thank you.